Have you ever heard of the Balanyiga Massacre? Few Americans have. It occurred in the Philippines in September of 1901, when a company of U.S. soldiers then in the midst of suppressing an effort by the Filipino people to gain their independence came under attack. That clash left 48 U.S. soldiers dead. Enraged, the U.S. commander in the field ordered his men to take revenge against the local populace. I want no prisoners, he told his troops. I wish you to kill and burn. The more you kill and burn, the more you will please me. Later, he was more specific, ordering his soldiers to kill everyone over the age of 10. Thousands of Filipino civilians died in the coming months. And when the American public eventually learned of these atrocities at Balanyiga, they were shocked, shocked that Americans could do such things. And they'd have that same reaction many more times in the coming decades. Because we always forget. We always forget that there are costs to projecting U.S. military power all around the world. Costs way beyond dollars and cents. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more... To a huddled union, masses yearning to breathe consider free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody is free until everybody is free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History is about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, a podcast about history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 26 in which we look at the Spanish-American War and how it constituted a major turning point in American history. We are coming to you this week from the Rough Riders Studios, located on the campus of Holy Cross College in Worcester, Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com, and on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Dispensing both encouragement and tough love as needed is our executive producer, Lulu Spencer whose burdens these days are considerably lighter, thanks to the work of our associate producer, Devin McHugh. So what's going on at In the Past Lane this week? Well, in this episode, we take a close look at a small war that had a massive impact on American history. In fact, the U.S. is still dealing with its effects at this very moment, since there are thousands of American military personnel stationed all around the world, notably in places like Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and Korea. Remarkably, we can trace the origins of American interventionism to the Spanish-American War that began in 1898, the so-called Splendid Little War. We'll start this episode with a brief overview of the history leading up to the war and then, once it started, how it played out. Then I'll talk to historian Stephen Kinzer about his latest book, titled The True Flag, Theodore Roosevelt, Mark Twain, and the Birth of American Empire. This book takes a close look at the Spanish-American War, the great debate it triggered over imperialism, and how its resolution marked a new and troubling chapter in American history. Okay, people, time to go in search of new frontiers. Your journey in the past lane begins now. Before we get to my conversation with Stephen Kinzer about the Spanish-American War, let's take a few minutes to think about how Americans viewed the place of their nation in the world. For the most part, from the founding of the Republic to the 1890s, the U.S. held to a largely isolationist foreign policy. Now, I say largely for two reasons. First, the United States did occasionally sign treaties with other nations. Think of the Jay Treaty, for example. And it occasionally fought wars, like the War of 1812. I also say largely because the United States was hardly isolationist when it came to expanding its influence and boundaries in North America, you know, in its quest to become a continental power, manifest destiny and all that. But when it came to European affairs, the default stance of the United States was to keep its distance. Now, why was this the case? Why were U.S. officials committed to staying out of European affairs? The answer stemmed from the way Americans thought about republics. On the one hand, 
They believed that Republican government was the most desirable form of government in the world. It was the best, hands down. But these same Americans believed that while republics were awesome, they were also fragile and vulnerable. And that's why the Founding Fathers, and the many generations of political leaders that followed them, like to refer to the U.S. as, quote, our Republican experiment. It was heading in the right direction, they said, but the Republic could be destroyed at any moment by outside meddling or diplomatic intrigue. So, in order to survive, and to keep the Republican experiment flourishing, U.S. leaders in the early Republic developed a foreign policy based on two principles. Number one, stay the hell out of European affairs. Number two, influence the world by setting a good example. All right, so let's take a look at the first one, staying out of European affairs. This idea was famously set forth by George Washington in his farewell address. The United States, he said, had to avoid at all costs what he called the insidious wiles of foreign influence. Because it was, he said, one of the most baneful foes of Republican government. In other words, for the American Republic to endure and prosper, it had to avoid European diplomatic intrigues and wars. So there's the basic argument for isolationism. But Washington and the founders believed the United States did have one important role to play in the world. Hence the second principle. The United States would influence the world, but only by example. You see, the founders and their successors believed that republicanism was destined to spread around the world. But it was not the place of the United States to make this happen by starting wars or invading foreign territories. Instead, the United States would lead by example. So if 17th century Puritans established Boston as a city upon a hill to inspire a purification and reformation of Christendom in Europe, 19th century Americans thought of their country as a nation upon a hill, a shining example of republicanism that the world should emulate. So in the late 1840s, when Republican revolutionaries rose up across Europe to overthrow monarchy and establish Republican governments, how did Americans respond to this? Well, they cheered them on believing that the American example of republicanism was finally spreading to the old world. But when the monarchies of Europe crushed these rebellions, there were no calls for U.S. military intervention or diplomatic assistance. America's job, they believed, was to lead by example, and the people of the world would have to win their republican revolutions on their own. But some four decades later in the 1890s, the United States made a profound shift from isolationism to interventionism. And the inspiration for this shift was Cuba, an island held as a colony by the Spanish. The native Cuban people had begun to wage a war for independence from Spanish rule, and the Spanish, they would have none of it. And they launched a military campaign to crush the would-be Cuban revolution. Now, before we get into the details of this saga that ultimately led the United States to declare war on Spain, let's answer the question, why did the United States in the 1890s turn from isolationism to interventionism? Well, advocates for interventionism put forth many arguments in favor of their position. One was economic. U.S. manufacturers, they claimed, they needed new markets for their goods. Otherwise, the American economy would suffer. Another reason was military. In order to protect national security and those aforementioned new markets, the United States needed naval bases around the world to house and refuel its navy. And there was a racist argument that was summed up in the phrase, the white man's burden. Civilized nations like the United States, well, they had an obligation to take over foreign lands inhabited by people deemed unfit for self-rule. But the most prominent interventionist argument by far was the Republican Crusader argument. Interventionists said that the old, lead-by-example foreign policy was no longer appropriate. It had been appropriate when the Republic was weak and vulnerable, but now, now the United States was the most powerful industrial nation in the world. And with that power, said interventionists, came certain responsibilities to promote and protect republicanism. Well, it was this Republican crusader idea that was most on the minds of Americans as they began to watch the Spanish attempt to crush the Cuban liberation movement in the mid-1890s. And by watched, I mean they read lurid accounts of Spanish atrocities against the Cuban people in the so-called yellow press of the day. Those were newspapers published by William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. And these papers took up the Cuban cause and urged the United States to intervene. For a time, U.S. officials resisted the call to war. Even after the USS Maine mysteriously blew up in Havana Harbor in February 1898, an incident that killed 260 U.S. sailors. 
But eventually, in early April 1898, President William McKinley called upon Congress to declare war on Spain. Congress did so on April 25th, and what ensued was called the Splendid Little War. Splendid and little because it lasted just a few weeks, and, relative to other wars, cost few American lives. The war ended in August, and in the ensuing treaty that followed, the United States acquired control of not just Cuba, but also the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and the Pacific island of Guam. All of a sudden, the American Republic, long committed to isolationism, had become a colonial power. And the United States soon discovered that being a colonial power, even on a small scale, was complicated business. Most notably because the people of Cuba, the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Guam demanded their independence. Wasn't that the point of the war, they asked? To intervene in the defense of Republican principles to defeat the Spanish and thereby gain us our independence? Just like the French in the 1770s helped the United States gain its independence from Great Britain? Many Americans, people who would eventually be called the anti-imperialists, agreed with this view. But they faced intense opposition from others, the interventionists, who argued that the U.S. needed to rule these territories indefinitely. Self-determination for Cubans and the others, they argued, would have to wait years, if not decades. Well, this policy of American colonialism was resisted by the peoples of the former Spanish Empire. They wanted their independence, especially in the Philippines. There, the refusal of the United States to recognize Filipino self-determination led to the Filipino insurrection, a horribly bloody war in which U.S. forces, yes, the very same forces that had arrived in 1898 as liberators, killed as many as 100,000 native Filipinos by 1902. And so it was. What began as a war to end Spanish atrocities and to defend human rights became a war marked by U.S. atrocities in the name of American empire. Well, to help us make sense of this dramatic shift in U.S. policy and its repercussions for the 20th and 21st centuries, I'll sit down with Stephen Kinzer, author of a new book, the True Flag, Theodore Roosevelt, Mark Twain, and the Birth of American Empire. Don't go anywhere, people. In the Past Lane, a podcast about history and why it matters. We'll be right back. If you are enjoying this podcast, then please subscribe to In the Past Lane at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you access your podcasts. Subscribing is free, and once you do it, new episodes of In the Past Lane are automatically downloaded to your listening device. Subscribing also gives you access to the entire back catalog of In the Past Lane episodes. And if you do subscribe, please leave a review. Thanks. Okay, we are back at In the Past Lane. With me now is Stephen Kinzer. Stephen Kinzer is an award-winning scholar of American history and U.S. foreign affairs. He is a senior fellow at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University. Kinzer is also the author of many books, including The Brothers, John Foster Dulles, Alan Dulles, and Their Secret World War, as well as Overthrow, America's Century of Regime Change from Hawaii to Iraq. His latest book, like many of his previous works, takes a hard look at America's pension for military intervention abroad. In this case, Kinzer examines the original foreign intervention, the Spanish-American War that began in 1898. Here to talk to us about this book, The True Flag, Theodore Roosevelt, Mark Twain, and the Birth of American Empire, is Stephen Kinzer. Welcome to In the Past Lane. Good to be with you. Well, thank you. Your book focuses on a key moment in American history, roughly 1898 to 1902 or so, when the United States makes this really momentous decision to become a global power, or you can, you know, people debate whether it's imperialism, interventionism, what have you. But the fact is that after 1898, the U.S. is really committed to projecting its military power overseas. And before we dive into this really fascinating and important chapter in American history, I think it's important to kind of circle back or go back in time a bit. So maybe you could begin by explaining to our listeners what the basis of U.S. foreign policy was had been, you know, what it had been from the founding period up to the 1890s, really the first century of the American Republic, the foreign policy stance of America was quite different from what it would be from the 1890s forward. 
You're absolutely right. 1898 was probably the year in which the United States changed more dramatically than in any year in its history. So up until 1898, the United States was an expansionist power, but we were expanding within North America. That concept of manifest destiny that emerged in the 1840s meant that it was the manifest destiny of European settlers in North America to fill up North America. We achieved that by conquering a large part of Mexico, clearing native peoples, and settling most of North America. At that time, the United States was not focused on international politics. We did have some interventions, for example, the famous Commodore Perry mission to Japan, but those were interventions that were one-offs. They were not part of a larger project aimed at promoting American global power. The great question came when, at the end of the 19th century, the United States had essentially completed its progress toward creating what you could call a continental empire. We had our first empire in North America. Then what do we do? That became the great question. Do we stop now that we've gotten to California and stop expanding as we essentially have been doing ever since the pilgrims landed and now concentrate on building up our own country? Or having been expansionist all this time, do we now seek to expand across the seas? Also, one other factor is, you know, like you say, this sort of idea of the, at least an idea of the closing of the frontier and what's next. But another thing is that by 1900 or by the 1890s, the U.S. also is, is something that it wasn't 100 years earlier, which is the leading global industrial power. And in some ways, the, there's a linkage there, isn't there, between having economic might, if not yet military might, and a sense that with this strength comes responsibilities. At least some people are thinking in those terms. By the end of the 19th century, American farmers and American manufacturers had so successfully mastered techniques of mass production that we were producing more than we could consume. Having spent a lot of time reading the newspapers of that age, I can tell you from my own experience that these newspapers were full of comments about the issue that was then called glut, the surplus. What right. do we do with it? This problem was creating real tensions inside the United States. It provoked strikes. It provoked labor conflicts in which people were killed. It provoked riots. Essentially, the United States was looking for a way to export its social problems. And the solution that was urged over and over again by industrial groups, farmers groups, business groups was, we need to take foreign countries so that those will be the markets for our goods. In those days, that was the main attraction of taking colonies. You could then force those colonies to trade only with you. And the idea was European countries are doing this. In order to relieve the pressure at home of overproduction, we need to start projecting power. And that means we need military power. It's sometimes said that commerce follows the flag. It's actually the other way around. Commerce starts because we need to be in other countries for business reasons. Then the flag arrives to protect them with military power. Right. And so one thing that's very important here, you talk about the projection of military power and thinking back to the days of George Washington, and you end your book by sort of circling back to Washington's important farewell address and the very, very important warnings that he issues in the earliest days of the Republic. And so in order to do this, in order to become a global power and project our power and to take possession of other lands, we really have to become something that would have horrified many of the founding fathers because they had a very clear perception that staying out of world affairs to the extent that it was possible was essential because the, the world is a dangerous place. Europe in, in particular is full of intrigue and that somehow if we get pulled into these alliances and treaties and wars, it's going to be the doom of the republic. This was certainly true because of the nature of the liberating ideology that was on the foundation of American democracy. We proclaimed this idea that government derives its just powers from the consent of the governed. And the idea that we would now try to impose our will on foreign peoples horrified many Americans. In addition, we never resolved the great debate over 
how the United States should play its wonderful, exceptional role in the world. What does it mean to be the city upon the hill? Does it mean that you have the responsibility to go out and redeem and purify the world? Or does it mean that you need to build up your own society so that it would be a model to others? The idea that a country that had begun as a colony would now begin to take colonies horrified many Americans. And that's what produced this great debate at the end of the 19th century. But before we get to that sort of seizure of other territories and, you know, becoming a colonial power ourselves, that's not exactly the way that the crisis in Cuba was discussed. So Cuba is a colony of Spain, and they've been struggling for their independence for quite some time in the 1880s and 1890s. And the United States takes greater and greater interest in this in the 1890s. And the initial impulse And the initial focus of the discussion is we need to help these people, like seeing somebody get mugged across the street or seeing, you know, a child in a second story window of a burning building. We are we can't just sit by and watch this crushing of a would be freedom movement right on our doorstep. So we needed to intervene. And the idea there is that we're going to help them get their independence. And that's what many people believe. But then it turns into something quite different very, very quickly. The Cubans, of course, had been fighting against Spain for some years, as you point out. In the spring of 1898, the publisher William Randolph Hearst, seeking ways to build up the circulation of his newspaper, concluded that war would be the greatest running story of all, a story that makes people want to buy newspapers every day. And if the United States could somehow be involved in a war somewhere and American soldiers were fighting, he could build that up into a series of heroic escapades that would sell lots of newspapers. And he set out quite consciously to push the United States to war in Cuba. He did so with the technique to which you refer. Americans are very compassionate people. We hate the idea that people are suffering anywhere. And our leaders know this. Whenever they want to get us involved in any war or conflict anywhere in the world, all they do is wave around a picture showing some brutalized and oppressed person. And then we Americans who are so compassionate feel like we have to go to war there to save those people. So Hearst was a great promoter of what was then called yellow journalism, what we now call fake news. Right. (laughs) And he filled up his columns with stories about brutal repression and suffering in Cuba, much of which was written by reporters who had never even been in Cuba. But it had the desired effect. It brought the United States into that war in Cuba in order to prevent the Spanish from attacking the United States in retribution. We went and found the Spanish naval fleet. It happened to be based in a place no American had ever heard of, the Philippine Islands. We destroyed it there. And that's when the trouble started, because the war, as you point out, had been about Cuba. And now suddenly we were in a country on the other side of the world. It had been a colony of Spain for centuries. Now the Spanish fleet was at the bottom of Manila Bay. So what do we do? Are are we now going to use this war as an excuse to take countries on the other side of the world? This was not at all what the war began to be. And the question of what it should now become with this wonderful opportunity now presented to us is what seized Americans and set off this great debate. Certainly from the perspective of Filipinos and Cubans and others, they're in a position of saying, thank you very much for getting rid of our colonial oppressor. Now, please go. We're good. We've got this. And there are many people in Congress and in the administration that say, not so fast. We've gained your independence, but we're not sure we're ready to relinquish our control over these what turn out to be very valuable assets. And that, as you say, triggers an incredible debate. Before we get that, we should point out that, you know, the Spanish-American War produces more than just simply these global possessions, but it also produces some important figures, especially Theodore Roosevelt. I mean, this is his great shining moment. He's, He's already famous in the 1890s, but he becomes globally famous as a result of his exploits and fabulous press coverage, as you point out at San Juan Hill and in Cuba. And that's important not just because of the war, but important in the aftermath, because Roosevelt emerges as one of the great advocates of what we would call imperialism. He does, although Roosevelt's career is quite interesting. As in my book, I posit him as he was in those days, in the 1890s, the greatest advocate of nation-grabbing in American history. He was a relentless proponent of the idea of war. He believed that war was the only 
decent, worthwhile pursuit for a man or for a nation. Right. And he wanted the United States to proceed with, if possible, the annexation of the entire world. Nonetheless, after coming into office, with the exception of the first intervention that he carried out to take land for the Panama Canal, he then turned his attention to other matters. He did not try to make war on Canada, seize Mexico, annex Nicaragua or Guatemala, as was being discussed, seize portions of China, try to take colonies in Africa, all of which were also thought perhaps ideas that Roosevelt would have in his head. He changed his mind. He focused on completely different issues of controlling big business and protecting the natural environment. It reflects a pattern that goes all the way up to President Obama. And that is that American presidents tend to come into office thrilled with the idea of using military power. They have this great instrument at their disposal, and they want to use it to bend the world to their will. As years pass, the sorrows of empire become clear, the body bags start coming back, the criticism emerges, the blowback starts, trouble begins in the target country, American security is often also compromised. And by the end of their terms, presidents tend to be a little more reluctant to use military power. I think that's a good pattern. You'd just wish that every president wouldn't have to learn it all over again. Absolutely. Sort of learn the hard way. And by then, you're already committed. The genie is out of the bottle. And for Roosevelt, I guess the learning episode for him is the aftermath of what takes place in the Philippines. We seize hold of Cuba, Philippines, Puerto Rico, and so forth. And the Philippines turns out to be an incredibly fraught situation. The Filipino independence movement is not willing to accept American occupation, and they begin a resistance movement almost immediately. And it turns into an incredibly bloody, savage affair that really calls into question, you know, we're essentially saying in the name of democracy and human rights, we are going to hold on to the Philippines for their own good. Yet the only way that that's going to be carried out is that the, you know, a war, a war of repression that's going to lead to, in some cases, people are guessing over 100,000 people killed. And the stories that come out of that, you know, the subsequent stories that come out of what our soldiers were doing in the Philippines are really shocking, both in the early 20th century and when you read them in the pages of history. Indeed, the war in the Philippines was a shattering episode and horrifically brutal. It's remarkable, although perhaps understandable, that very few Americans are even aware that this war ever happened. It's completely dropped out of our history books. And I think the reason for that is that it doesn't show us the way that we like to think that we are. Uh, it was horrifically brutal. We had our first big torture scandal there. Right. The origins of what we call waterboarding date back to this. Absolutely. Although I can tell you, having researched this, that the real origin of waterboarding starts in the Spanish Inquisition. The Spanish soldiers then brought it to the Philippines and taught it to their allies. Those allies then taught it to the Americans who came there. So that's the genesis of the waterboarding that we saw at Abu Ghraib and uh, Guantanamo. I do think that the Americans, uh, particularly the imperialists like uh, Henry Cabot Lodge and President McKinley, believed that the Filipinos would be thrilled to see American soldiers take over their country. The Filipinos had been fighting, as you point out, for independence against Spain. It was the American view that, of course, uh, nobody would want to be governed by Spain because Spain was a horrible, evil country. But everybody would want to be governed by the United States. The idea that Filipinos didn't want to be governed by any foreign power and wouldn't see much difference between being governed by Spain or being governed by the United States never entered the minds of Americans. We truly believed they would welcome us with flowers and were outraged when they did not. After one of their first attacks, the New York Times had a headline I found that said, insane attack of these people upon their liberators. It then fell to President McKinley to explain to Americans how they could square this geopolitical circle. How could it be justified for the first time in American history to send American soldiers across an ocean to a distant country to shoot down people who honestly believed that they were fighting for their own freedom and, and their own independence. McKinley came to Boston to deliver a major speech to try to answer this question. It was the biggest banquet ever held in the United States, a momentous event. And he had a great line which resonates through history. He said, did we need their consent to perform a great act for humanity? We had it 
in every hope of their hearts, in every aspiration of their minds. In other words, they didn't realize how much they needed us, but we realize how much they need us. And for their benefit, we're going to kill enough of them until they shut up and realize how good our rule is going to be. It's a great example of being blinded by your, by your own idealism in a lot of ways and finding a way to, to rationalize it. And you mentioned a banquet that brings to mind that there's more than one banquet in this era that's taking up this question of what America should do. And this raises the rivalry that you sort of center a lot of the book around, which is, of all people, Mark Twain, who we think of as just a really hilarious, folksy country humorist, and Theodore Roosevelt, really representing the polar views on, on this idea of interventionism and occupation. So could you tell our audience a little bit more about that, including that they actually have some face-to-face showdowns at, at some of these banquets? Theodore Roosevelt and Mark Twain are wonderfully matched antagonists. One of the interesting discoveries I made when writing this book has to do with Mark Twain. I had what I now realize was quite a partial view of Mark Twain. As you point out, uh, I thought of him as the Mr. Nice Guy who rocks on his front porch and tells gentle jokes and is beloved by everyone. In fact, Mark Twain was a bitter, vituperative, anti-imperialist. And this aspect of his persona has sort of fallen out of, of history. Many of the quotes that I have from him in my book do not appear in biographies or anthologies. I think Twain has been bleached right. for our public consumption, but he was bitter. And in some ways, he and Roosevelt were well-matched because they were both kind of egomaniacs mm-hmm. who created their own persona. But Roosevelt believed in war, fighting. He also was a great racist who believed that white people were destined to rule other nations. Twain had traveled to places like South Africa, Indian subcontinent. He had seen the ugly face of European imperialism and how brutal it was. So he greatly admired the native peoples that Roosevelt held in such contempt. The two of them were acutely aware of each other's popularity and therefore did not denounce each other directly in public. But we do know what they thought of each other from some of their comments and writings. Mark Twain said that he thought Theodore Roosevelt was clearly insane and the greatest disaster that has befallen the country since the Civil War. Right, harsh criticism. Roosevelt returned the favor by saying he would like to skin Mark Twain alive. So that was the essence of this great intellectual and political debate that exploded at the end of the 19th century. They make for a very interesting pair, as you say, in in lots of ways. And If I'm not mistaken, Twain was initially sort of a supporter of liberating Cuba, but once that turned into occupation, he changed his mind. Is that a fair assessment? It's true. And that was the case for all of the major anti-imperialists. A huge anti-imperialist movement exploded in the spring of 1898. And the basis for that political movement was not the U.S. should not be intervening in Cuba to help the Cubans overthrow the Spanish. The anti-imperialists were fine with that. But they insisted that this war could only be a war aimed at achieving independence for Cuba. It should not be transformed into a war in which the United States is trying to grab other territories. And it was that transition, the change in war goals from liberating Cuba to taking islands all over the world that turned Mark Twain and others who had initially supported the Spanish-American War into bitter opponents of American expansionism. Yes, he's part of a large and very illustrious team of anti-imperialists. I mean, it's a really diverse crowd, but also a series of incredibly important people, starting with Andrew Carnegie, arguably the richest, most powerful industrialist in the nation, social reformer Jane Addams, labor union leader Samuel Gompers, William Jennings Bryan, And Booker T. Washington, whose opposition is interesting because it's not simply based on the idea that America shouldn't occupy other peoples and deny them self-rule. He's thinking also about the American scene as well. Could you elaborate on that interesting sort of sub-story to this? There's a remarkable coalition emerging towards the middle and late months of 1898. Almost every major political and intellectual figure in America stood up to take sides in this debate. 
the Anti-Imperialist League, as you said, embraced quite a remarkable array of people from plutocrats like Andrew Carnegie to great social reformers. The two past presidents of the United States, Benjamin Harrison and Grover Cleveland, were also opponents of American expansionism and supported many of the goals of the Anti-Imperialist League. This league mailed out hundreds of thousands of leaflets and had meetings all over the country. So although it's dropped out of our history books, the Anti-Imperialist League was a major force in American political life around the turn of the last century. And you make an important point, which is that in subsequent generations, we we see anti-war movements emerging. And we often think of that sort of happening, many people think of it as happening first during the 1960s in the Vietnam War. But there's a long tradition of anti-war and anti-imperialist sentiment that dates right back to this particular time period. And they, you know, in framing their, their opposition, it's not simply that they're pacifists, some of them are, but they are really looking at what they think are the founding ideals. The founding ideals of self-determination, of human rights, of self-rule, self-democracy, and saying that if we do this, this imperialism and occupation thing, we are going to lose our Republican soul. And there's another dimension to it, which is the only way you can carry this out is to overturn another cardinal Republican small R principle, which is small military. No big standing army, no big navy, because that would be the, you know, Washington warned about that too, saying that that would threaten the future of the Republic. And so there's a couple of really major foundational questions that these anti-imperialists raise in the midst of this great debate. You're right, and that's one of the purposes for which I wrote this book. The message is that for people like me who believe that American foreign policy has gone off in a wrong direction, we are not making up this argument. This is not something new. It's not a marginal idea in American politics or history. The idea that America should have a prudent and restrained foreign policy and not try to influence the course of events in faraway countries is an idea that is deeply rooted in American history. We are standing on the shoulders of titans. And one thing that became very clear to me as I was writing about not just the general political debate, but this epochal 32-day debate in the U.S. Senate over this question is that it's also contemporary. Every argument that we've ever used in favor of or against U.S. intervention in Vietnam, Central America, Iraq, Syria, all starts with this original debate back in 1899 in the U.S. Senate. Every argument we use today was used then. In the history of American foreign policy, this is really the mother of all debates. It all starts here, and it is so contemporary. It's so striking to read the speeches, which I reproduce in part in my book, of the senators and others speaking on this great issue, and to see how immediately relevant their arguments are to today. We still have not resolved the question they were debating more than a century ago. That debate you set up really is really the kind of centerpiece in some ways of of the book. And it's a, a debate that most people are completely unaware of, as you point out. But it involves both the Senate And it's a prolonged debate over a month long and one that is followed with great detailed interest by the American people. And then the focus shifts to the Supreme Court. So could you tell us in a nutshell, you know, how those two debates played out? All of my books are voyages of discovery. I'm always looking for some hugely important event in history that for whatever reason we forgot about or we don't know about. And for me in this book, the great discovery is that this debate ever happened. I had always been aware, as most of us are who've studied this period, that it was right around 1898, 1899, when the United States began projecting its military power beyond North America. That's the period in which we went from being a continental empire to being an overseas empire. But I had always assumed that that jump was natural. It just came more or less automatically. It was was just the next step. Actually, the complete opposite is true. That step was hugely controversial. It set off one of the epochal debates in American history. 32 days, the U.S. Senate spent debating the question, not just of whether we should take the Philippines, which was on the table at that moment, but the larger question of whether the United States should begin to start pushing its influence militarily into faraway lands. 
So in that 32-day debate, you see all these great themes coming forward. And the one depressing thing about reading that congressional debate, and I think I might be the first one who's read it in generations, is that the senators are so articulate. They're so much wiser and historically versed right. than the senators we have today. Right. Many classical references and references to ancient history. It's, it's quite, a, quite an extraordinary moment of oratory. Indeed. And so the United States was totally focused on this debate, as you point out. Every day's newspapers were talking about how many senators on this side or that side, what different bribes were being offered by the White House to various senators. Even diplomats from other countries posted in Washington were sending back daily reports because this decision that the U.S. Senate was going to make was not just going to affect the United States. It was going to shake the whole world, as indeed it did. So the result of that 32-day debate was that the U.S. Senate voted that it, we should proceed to begin taking other countries, particularly the Spanish islands, and we did that with a margin of one vote more than the required two-thirds majority. So just one vote decided that epochal question. And that was a debate that began with one senator saying, this is the greatest question that has ever been presented to the American people. He was right. It was. It still is. After the decision was made in the Senate, anti-imperialists took this question to the U.S. Supreme Court. Right. First of all, they argued that the United States uh, had no constitutional authority to govern other countries because the Constitution says the U.S. government only has powers enumerated in the Constitution. It doesn't mention ruling foreign countries at all. In addition, they argued, it's not legal for Americans to rule anybody without giving them constitutional rights. The Supreme Court ruled against this argument by a vote of five to four. So again, one vote margin. Yep, another narrow one. It shows you how narrow this debate has been. And although the anti-imperialists lost that uh, round, I think they had a big impact on American history. At that time, we were annexing countries. We were just seizing them like Puerto Rico or the Philippines. We stopped doing that. We found other ways to begin dominating countries. And I think that tension in Amer the American mind has never been resolved. We, we do want to dominate the world, but we also want every country to guide itself. Now, you can't believe both of those things because they're opposite, but we, st but we believe them both anyway. We hold both of these contradictory views in our head, right. and that accounts for our conflicted approach to the world. Yeah, it certainly has stayed with us for a very, very long time. And that sort of leads me to another question, which is, how does this play out? Usually, you know, when I interview historians, sometimes their books are on, say, the American Civil War or on earlier chapters in American history. And I still ask the same question. How, how is your topic relevant today? What does it speak to us about in 2017? In the case of your book, it's, <laughs> it's, not, a, it's not a hard question to ask. This debate, as you say, starts in full force in, in the early 20th century, but it never quite goes away. And this tension between intervention and I don't know if we'd call it isolationism, but intervention and, and being more cautious runs throughout the 20th and now into the 21st century. And that's actually part of your previous book, The Brothers, looking at the Dulles Brothers. And, you know, the, the subtitle is the, And Their American Wars. I mean, they are the great interventionists often behind the scenes in the 20th century. And there's a lot of wreckage that they leave behind. So how does this tension, what's important about this debate in our times right now, because we're still very much an interventionist nation. So many of the predictions that were made around 1900 about what would happen to the United States if we pursued this path have come true. We have become a country where militarization is a very uh, central part of our national life. Our foreign policy is heavily militarized. We have hundreds of military bases around the world. We do believe that whenever there's a crisis or a confrontation anywhere in the world. The United States has to get involved. We believe we're the indispensable nation. We see ourselves as something like the sun around which all other countries should rotate like other minor planets. No other country on earth sees itself this way. We've developed this conception of ourselves as the place that needs to set the rules and, and rule the world effectively. And it's remarkable how slow we are to change. It doesn't seem that the mistakes, the tragedies that have followed our interventions, whether it's Vietnam or Iraq or Afghanistan, ever seem to register. In Washington, 
there's absolutely no upside to urging that the United States do less in the world. You always have to argue that you want America to do more than what everyone else wants America to do. You want to spend more on the military. You want to invade more countries. This idea that we should be more prudent, we should be restrained, we should pull back, we should think about ourselves, we should not assume that we know what's good for the world better than the world itself knows. These ideas are not welcome in Washington. We are an activist nation. We're a missionary nation. We're a teaching nation. We're not a learning nation. And this is what has brought us into conflict with so many countries and groups and people around the world. Right. And as you point out, there's this great debate in the late 19th, early 20th century. And what we have now is essentially no debate or the debate is not about whether to intervene and to project military power abroad, but how and how much and for how long. And that's a really different political culture, really different posture for the American Republic compared to its founding, compared to the debate in 1899 in the early 20th century. And I think that we have a lot to learn from history. That is truly a great difference between that era and this era. Right now, we in Washington run the spectrum of opinions on foreign affairs from A to B. You really have to accept a bunch of assumptions about American power in the world, even to be allowed to function in the Washington environment. All Democrats and Republicans, with very few exceptions, agree on the idea of liberal hegemony in the world. The think tanks in Washington and the press beat the same drum. Any suggestion of a really new approach for American foreign policy is treated in Washington like the germ of some frightful disease that must be stamped out before it can infect the entire policy process. We do exactly as you say. We question whether we, did the, we had the right tactics in Iraq or whether it was another country we should have invaded instead. But we don't question the idea of whether the United States really serves its own interests or the interests of the world by believing that it has the solution to the problems of every other country. Well, it's a question that I think is going to be with us for a very, very long time. And another good example of how history can, uh, you know, having a deep knowledge of history can ideally, anyway, inform decision making, especially by people with, with power. Well, thank you very much, Stephen Kinzer. This has been a great conversation and your book is really terrific. And I've enjoyed reading it, and I hope you're uh, getting opportunities to talk about it because it's very, very timely. I'm out here beating my spoon on the high chair, just like you. (laughs) Very good. All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you. Stephen Kinzer is a senior fellow at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University. I spoke with him today about his latest book, The True Flag, Theodore Roosevelt, Mark Twain, and the Birth of American Empire just published by Henry Holt and Company and available everywhere. All right, everyone. Time to close out this episode of In the Past Lane. As always, thanks for listening. To learn more about the stuff we discussed in this episode, just go to our show page at inthepastlane.com. There you'll find recommended readings, links, and more. And people, please, send us your comments, questions, and suggestions via Twitter, where I tweet as at inthepastlane, and Instagram, same thing, inthepastlane, and Facebook at inthepastlane podcast. I'm In The Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu, the weather's looking awesome. You going to join us for the annual in the past lane golf outing? It's about as likely as a lightning strike. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. (laughs) 